All right, welcome back to Computer Science E259. My name is David Malin, and this is Lecture 5, XPath 1 and XSLT 1, with a little bit of 2.0 tossed in, continued. So a couple of announcements. One, there's been relatively little chatter on the listserv, which either suggests the Project 2 is going wonderfully well, or Project 2 isn't quite yet going. So uh, I will make no assumptions, but uh, do bear in mind that there's two major components to the project, my blockbuster parts preceded by the little bite-sized part of uh, B2B time, and then finally Xtube. And realize Xtube has its own dual components, one of which is the XHTML component, and the other of which is the SVG component. Um, next week is lecture six. I need to be uh, out of town presenting at a conference, so you will actually get the night off, sort of, um, rather than our risking falling behind on the syllabus, though, we're going to do an internet-only lecture, one time only next week, where we'll use um, previously recorded material that is identical and applicable to what we're doing this semester. And what I will do is also supplement that with um, a digital recording of some walkthrough of the SVG component of the project and so forth, similar in spirit to what we do in section each week. So I'll make this more clear over email, but just to be clear, no uh, class here next week, lecture or section, but we'll return in two weeks, but the syllabus itself doesn't change, so we'll use technology to redress this uh, particular hiccup. Any questions before we proceed? No? Oh, which means no brownies next week either, so. Two weeks, maybe. Two weeks. All right. All right. So um, tonight's fun because we'll continue our discussion of XSLT and XPath, do a number of additional demonstrations, and really try to learn some more of this stuff by doing and by inference and by experimenting. I spent the week practicing with Stylus Studio after emailing my friends who, recall, wrote the first version of that product. And we had a little discussion about the what's now the ninth version of that product. Um, but I'm very good with Stylus right now, so I won't look like an idiot tonight demoing the software that we're promoting that you use. Um, and let's get to it. So last week, we looked at CSS, XPath, XSLT, tiny bit of tracks, more of a mere mention for now, and then Project 2. Uh, CSS was related only insofar as it is another style sheet language that you're welcome to use in your own projects and such, but the point last week was just to distinguish it at, from what is a, our new style sheet language, XSLT, the latter of which is much more powerful, much more expressive, as you already began to see, and you'll see a bit more tonight. Uh, CSS, I would put in more in the bucket of a, an, uh, a tool for aesthetically modifying your markup and for taking things aesthetically the final mile, whereas XSLT is actually a, a language unto itself, programming language. Uh, XPath 1, or just XPath in general, what is XPath used for or good for? Perfect. So identifying nodes and attributes and other uh, and elements and such in an XML file. It's a query language insofar as you can just request nodes from a document. It uses the notion of relative nodes. So if you have a node set in the current context, so to speak, all of your queries or paths are relative, as you've seen, to that current node set. Um, XSLT, meanwhile, uses XPath. XPath is the query language that XSLT tends to use as part of some of its expressions. What in a sentence is XSLT itself? Okay, transformation language, what does that mean? Perfect. So you, it's a transformative language in that you can give it input of XML and get output of XML, but somehow transformed. And the output doesn't even necessarily have to be uh, XML can be whatever sort of text that you opt to generate. I think you'll find through your own experience, as well as through some of the courses, projects, and our demos, that XSLT really has a, number, a wide ranges of uses, from quick and dirty uh, style sheets that you can whip up simply if you have some data that you need to convert or massage into a slightly different format. It's really good. It's simple, small tasks like that. And projects three and four will deploy it on the server side and actually apply transformations of XML data um, in outputting XHTML data and then sending the XHTML to the client. So it, as such, it can be used very much in the same spirit as, say, server-side PHP or CGI software, JSPs, the same sort of idea. It's simply the syntax is different and the sort of uh, data that you're manipulating, XML, is a little different, but it can be used in that context as well. So we'll use XSLT in particular throughout the course. Right now, we're focusing only with projects one and two on client-side um, experimentation and, pro and software, we will quickly move in a couple of lectures time and with project three to using things more server side. And it's at that point we'll revisit the notion of tracks, which is the transformation API for XML, 
a subset of Jack's P. And what that means for us is that there exist Java classes that are going to allow us in a couple of weeks' time to transform XML data uh, as well. So for now, we're using uh, Zalin at the command line, effectively, or these WYSIWYG tools that you yourselves may have been using, including XML Spy and Stylus. Um, couple, just let's toss a couple pieces of jargon out from last time. A location path. Just to be clear, because we'll toss this term around a lot. What is it in the sentence? You wanted brownies tonight. Come on. <laughs> yeah? So the navigation path from the loop down to whatever Perfect. So it's a sort of navigation path down from the root or down from any node to some other sequence of nodes that are somehow hierarchically related. A location path, to be more precise, has different components in it. If a location path, to put it in more um, you know, visual terms, is this long, it's made up of small chunks. And each of those chunks is what we would call a a step, and each step, meanwhile, has up to two components. An axis explicitly specified, followed by a, a predicate, yes, and then preceded by, then, a node test. So the predicate is what you can append to the node test. And the simplest sort of node tests that we've seen are just to say star, which means I match pretty much any element, for the most part. Uh, you can specifically say a node's name, and we've seen that as well. You can specifically mention a node's type, and we'll revisit some of these uh, node tests tonight. Uh, data types. Not a strongly typed language, XPath or XSLT, but there is the notion of strings and numbers and booleans and so forth, which each have their own related functions. But as we saw, there's a lot of automatic conversion that goes on that you might expect, where if it just so happens to be a string, but it looks like a number, well, XSLT and XPath are going to allow you to treat that numeric string as an actual integer and so forth. So as such, data types don't really get in the way for us. Um, Functions as well uh, are, exist, like starts with, you may have seen, or count, and any of those expressions followed by a set of parentheses, frankly, and you may have seen these in the online reference, are functions that you can apply to some data uh, of any type within your query. XSL team, meanwhile, had uh, three major categories of stuff we talked about last week, nodes, and nodes we've seen again and again, right? We saw it in DOM, we've seen it now in XPath and XSLT, and though technically these are all independent definitions as to what an attribute is, what a node is, what a document is, at the end of the day, it's all sort of the same thing so far as someone you know, versed in XML goes. Um, elements in XSLT, uh, give me one example of an XSLT element, just to be clear. XSL if, right? So just to be clear, any of those tags that we've been using that begin with XSL colon is an XSL element. And as we'll tease apart in a couple of weeks' time, the fact that we're saying XSL colon, that's just because we're using what's called a namespace. And it's a prefix that allows us to say, you know what, the element is actually just called if. But because in XSLT we like to intermingle, say, XHTML and XSLT, and we want the processor, like Zalin or Sp Stylus, to be able to distinguish the two. So we can decide, oh, H1, that just means print the following text big and bold, versus XSL colon if, that means wait, test the following condition. If we want the processor to behave intelligently, well, we need to prefix at least one set of those types of elements, XSLT or XHTML, and the convention is to prefix such elements with XSL colon. But it's completely arbitrary. We'll see examples in which we don't even have that prefix, um, and we'll see examples perhaps where we use a different prefix altogether. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Indeed, just to summarize and put this in context, and we, again, we'll come back to this, but yes, you have seen in all of your style sheets thus far, I believe that we've given you, the use of the XML NS prefix, which if we scroll further to the right in this particular example, what you will see is that we have, by way of this last attribute value pair, we've explicitly said that XSL is going to be a prefix, for a namespace, and that's what this particular prefix means. Specifically associate quote unquote XSL with this string. 
Now that string looks like a URL or URI more properly, merely a convention. What that effectively is is a unique identifier that the world adopted that says if you use this string and associate it with a prefix and you have uh, and you use it throughout your file, any s processor that supports XSLT 1.0 will know that that string means it should treat the input as XSLT. And again, we'll come back to this, but yes, you could change this to be foo and then use foo colon throughout your file. Indeed. It's just a unique identifier. The world has tended to use URIs for the simple reason that you're not going to get name collisions if you own the domain and therefore you're effectively managing all strings with that particular prefix yourself. But it could just be quote unquote David Malin's language called foo. And we could use that as the unique string. It'd just be unfortunate. Yeah. Good question. Does an actual substitution take place of XSL colon with that? Not per se. Instead, what happens is the processor, Zalin, upon reading the file, realizes, all right, so I should as assume that anything prefixed with XSL colon belongs in that namespace. Well, hard-coded into the implementation of Zalin is that string. And that string effectively tells Zalin what is an XSLT input. So in other words, if we made a typo there, it's the processor would be completely within its right to just choke on the file and say, I don't know what you've just given me. It says XSL colon all over the place, but I have no idea what that unique string is that you gave me. It will just text. It would choke on the processing of the XSLT. So it wouldn't process it. It shouldn't process it as XSLT. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. Right, this is sort of a more robust, if slightly more complicated way of associating files with applications. Right? Most OSs do this by way of file extensions. You know, the 8.3 format was sort of a very naive approach to this, but unfortunately with just three characters, you're very limited in your expressiveness. Here, you're not limited, but it's a different, perhaps more complicated or misleading approach initially. But again, more on that in our namespaces lecture. For now, it literally can be something you simply copy and paste. But there's really nothing complicated behind it. It's just a little uh, syntactically more complex than you might expect. Finally, templates and XSLT, these are sort of like the equivalent of methods or functions. And we've seen how we can define templates that just match different types of nodes. We'll see more of that tonight. And we've seen how you can invoke or call templates just like you might call or invoke a function or a method. All right, so tonight is about continuing along this path. Um, last week we focused more, or at least definitionally, on some of the data types and such present in XPath. Just to put it out there and to reiterate that there's so much overlap among these different domains, the types of data that XSLT understands are these, most of which you should expect. The most common one of which you'll be playing with is this thing called a node set. So just get used to talking in terms of node sets. Um, external objects allow you to embed other types of data within the file. For the most part, we'll wave our hands at that. We will make mention of this tonight. A result tree fragment, or RTF, is sort of a weird uh, data type that was in XSLT1 that fortunately uh, has been replaced in XSLT2. For now, we'll talk about it just so that you know um, exactly how what its implications are and how it sort of violates what your expectations might be as to the behavior of XSLT. But in short, um, you eventually won't have to worry about this. And it's not a complicated thing, it's just more of an FYI at this point. So we'll get to that. So just to put a few of the building blocks out there and to reiterate some of the things we sort of looked at on the fly last week, you can certainly in XSLT do conditions. Right? And we talked about it a moment ago again, XSL if is the way that you test some condition using the test attribute, quote unquote, something. You can put in there is uh, x less than uh, three, is x greater than three. Of course, a gotcha is if you want to type x less than three, you type, LT. right, LT semicolon, or ampersand LT semicolon. It's, welcome to XML, frankly. Um, unfortunately, contrary to what you might expect, there is no else or else if. 
And so I believe we mentioned this in section last week. There is that construct. It's just because terseness is of minimal importance in XML. It's the choose when otherwise construct. Um, let's pause for a moment for a question. Uh, if you want to do a non-equal kind of test, mm -hmm. is it bang equal? It's a good question. So how do you test for non-equality? So equality is just a single equal sign. It's not equals equals. In testing non-equality, there's two different approaches. One is not bang equal, as you might have in another programming language, and another approach is the not keyword. And so we'll actually come back to this because they're slightly different behavior. So we'll eventually see some examples. Um, unfortunately, the buck stops there with the XSL if. You can have an if, but you can't have an else. If you want the equivalent of an else, you have this construct, which intuitively not complicated, just verbose to actually type it out. You can have any number of these when statements here, as suggested by the ellipses. And if you want the so-called else, it's called XSL otherwise. Right? So some folks had some fun developing, uh, I think, choosing the names for these things. Hell, if you know, terseness is of a minimal importance, let's use otherwise as the statement instead of else. Um, iteration. This is something we saw. So the XSL for it, now I, though I may tease these things, it is a wonderfully useful language and I'm actually a big fan of uh, this particular uh, aspect of the material. Iteration. So we've seen this in the context of uh, looping over our movies in our movie database last week. Um, for each allows you to just iterate over a node set and what node set is that? It's whatever node set you actually select within the select statement. And just to recall verbally, we ran into a bit of a gotcha last week when inside of our for each we had an XSL value of, for instance, and that value of had a slash uh, step, slash step, slash step, but then we wanted to test um, the value of the node against what the node was that we were iterating over. And I'm realizing this isn't terribly, done terribly well verbally, but suffice it to say for now, and we'll come back to this, that we learned at this point of the current function. And recall that the current function, current, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, simply gets you back to whatever node is what you're iterating over. But this only works once. If you have nested for eaches, which you can have, you can't access the current nodes in the higher level for each constructs. It works only in one step upward. And we'll see, that'll be, I'll make that more clear, I think, in actual demos. Yeah? And that select is relative to a node that may have been gotten to in a previous step. Good question. So is the select relative to whatever node sets are, were put into context just prior to that? Um, yes. And that is the res that though is up to you. If you use start your query or your select statement with a forward slash, well, that literally will match the roots of the document, just like starting at CD slash and uh, the Unix system gets you back to the root of the hard drive. If you use relative paths, though, they will be done relative to whatever the context nodes or node sets are. Good question. Um, sorting, just to put the syntax out there, we introduced this just so we could sort our movie titles. Uh, if you look at an online reference or play with stylus, you'll see that there are a number of attributes, only a couple of which we looked at, but order is one of them. Order equals ascending, order equals descending. For instance, just allows you to control the order. And an FYI here was that if you have a sort in your uh, for each, it must be a, the first child of the for each. All right, so patterns and modes and templates in general. We concluded last week by focusing on templates, and these really are the so-called bread and butter of XSLT. Um, we looked at a couple of different sort of conceptual approaches to writing style sheets, what we dubbed the, the pull approach, which was all about for each for the most part, and the push approach, and we saw an example of that, and we'll see a bunch of demos tonight as well. But recall that XSLT behavior is entirely driven by templates, whether built-in templates that you didn't write or templates that you did, in fact, explicitly write. Uh, inside of this match statement, recall, goes a node test, so we can tell it to match all of the title nodes in a document or match all of the movie nodes in a document, and that's what we played with last week. And then you can also apply templates, templates explicitly and select what nodes you want the processor to apply whatever existing templates you have uh, to them. So again, this is generic syntax. We'll put this into context in just a moment after we get some of the, the building blocks out of the way. But just realize that as your style sheets grow more complex, either for project two or for own future work or f future projects in the course, there is the notion of modes. 
These are useful, for instance, if you want, while developing your style sheet or style sheets, to be able to alter the behavior dynamically while running, perhaps in simple form, just have a debug mode, where you can have multiple style sheets that during development behave one way, but when you actually deploy them, behave another way. And you can control which, style, which templates get used when you, apply that when you apply the style sheet to an XML file by simply specifying a mode. For instance, when you do your selects. And for now, because your style sheets haven't really warranted this yet, just know that when you define a template, you can specify a mode, which is sort of a cleaner way of implementing templates that behave differently because you don't have to change the names. For instance, you don't have to have a template, uh, a name template called foo, and then another name template called foo2, and then go through your file when you want to call one, changing all mentions of foo to foo2. Rather, you can simply give them different modes. For instance, production mode or development mode. And then when you actually apply templates, you just specify what mode you want to have applied. Again, we'll postpone using these very much because our style sheets thus far are pretty simple. But if you find yourself in need of some additional complexity in terms of numbers of templates, realize that you can start to distinguish which templates are invoked by way of this mode parameter. And just to relate this to the basic definition, this, at the end of the day, if you can sort of master a level of comfort with this slide, which is slightly more complicated than last, you will fundamentally understand XSLT. Really, the magic of XSLT comes from these three built-in templates, the templates that you get for free. Just like in some languages, you get the constructor, the implicit constructor for free. In XSLT, you get these for free. And the reason I'm repeating this slide in a slightly different form this week is just because now that you know that modes exist, even though we won't really use them for now, you get a built-in template for every mode that you might want to define. So just realize that if you start defining templates with additional modes, you will still get this default behavior unless you uh, short circuit it like we did last week. And let me take a question and then we'll come back to this. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. Correct. So, it's a good question. So, let me actually do this in the context of a file that we're familiar with probably. This is myblockbuster.xml. Uh, if I go over now to the other file you were given, myblockbuster.xsl, recall that it doesn't do all that much except match on this template node, the, the root node. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this template for now. And if I go ahead and click Execute, the Play button here, and thus apply it to myblockbuster.xml, knowing what you do about what we did last week and bearing in mind this slide, what output should I see when I click Play? Yeah. So all of the, let's associate this with my blockbuster. So we get down here. All of the text, certainly. All of the text, but almost perfect. Not the attributes. What you get is the concatenation of all of the textual descendants of the root node. So, and this will be an indirect answer to your question, but a more robust answer, I hope. Why did that happen? Just to recap last week, it happened because of these built-in templates. And for now, for simplicity, ignore the presence of the mode per, uh, attribute. This template here is sort of the catch-all, the main template, if you will, that you get for free. It matches on star, which is pretty much any element name, or the root. So vertical bar, recall, was our, um, or our union operator. So what this is matching on is either any element or the root of the document specifically. Now, it's a one-line template. What is it telling the processor to do upon matching the root or any element. Apply templates. And apply templates takes a select attribute whose default value we said last week is just star, aka child colon colon star. So just to repeat, if you apply these three templates, which look like they do terribly little, right? There's, no, there's not so much as a single literal character in this. There's just these templates and additional elements. If we apply this, 
to a style sheet. We'll recall that when you apply a style sheet to an XML file, the matching starts sort of as you would expect from the root on down. So that is to say, what is the very first node you encounter in a document? Well, the root of the document. Sort of a trivial question at this point, perhaps. Which template thus applies first? Well, obviously, this one. All right, so we've just matched. If this, think of this as setting a verbal, a mental breakpoint in the XSLT processor. We've just matched on the root using this template. This template tells us to apply all existing templates, whatever they are, to which nodes. Doesn't specify explicitly, but the implicit value of the select attribute in this call is star, aka child colon colon star. Well, what are the children of the root of the document? It's going to, well, specifically in our case, it was the, I think, slash, it's the database element. But just more generally, it's the root element of the document. Maybe some comments, maybe some processing instructions, but that is to say, what can be at the top of a document? Well, if nothing else, a root element. So the children of the root of the document are going to include the root element. All right, so what that's just said is, you know what, go apply whatever templates exist to the root element. Let's assume there are no PIs or comments. All right, so what then happens? The processor says, all right, here's the root element, and it's called database in our case. Well, what, which of these templates matches an element called database? The top one again. Why? Because it matches star. Star is a shorthand node test for saying a node of the principal node type of any name, of any name. Well, database is a name, and certainly satisfies the criterion of star. So which template gets applied? Well, yeah, the first one. And already there, you should immediately notice, wait a minute, recursiveness. And that, in short, is what jumpstarts the whole recursive process. So to distinguish now, and to answer your question more directly, what is the difference between a template and apply templates? A template is, the best way to think about it now, I think, is just it's a method, or it's a function that you define. Apply templates is equivalent to calling a method, or calling a function. But apply templates doesn't specify which method or which function to call. It just says, call whatever functions are appropriate. How do you know what's appropriate? Well, you look at what the value of the match attribute is, just like we did in our story. Which template is appropriate for the database element? Well, the first one, that's what apply templates does. It calls all of the functions on all of the appropriate nodes, all of the appropriate functions on all the appropriate nodes. And just to be thorough, there was one other related call that we saw, and that was not apply templates, but rather call template. And this was more of a procedural language approach to invoking these templates, where you don't just leave it to the processor to figure out what to go apply. You specifically say, call this template. And you can even pass in parameters, as we saw. OK, a question here and there. So why doesn't it match all the attributes when it's matching all the text? Because it looks like you know, the node test is the text. So it's a good question. So why is it not matching on the attributes? Well, suppose that the database element had an attribute. It doesn't in our example, but suppose it did, just so we can keep our story at this level in the document. If we're matching on the database element, you yourself said that we match with this template. Well, this template, the one-liner, says to match next on what? Who gets the templates applied to them? Children. The children of database. Never do these built-in templates say to apply templates to whom? Yeah. The attributes. Now we have a definition for an attribute down here, but we never actually apply it. Because again, and this is why I'm sort of reiterating what might seem like minor points, attributes are not children of elements. But they do have the elements as their parents. So again, not to dwell too long on the formalities, but honestly, especially if you're sort of struggling in writing your XSLT as to why it's not working or why you're getting so much extraneous output when all you wanted was, for instance, titles, honestly, the best service I think you can do for yourself at this point in the learning process, if you're struggling with any of this, just understand these three templates or the slightly simpler versions of them from last week. Yeah. Um, you get the, the built-in template for attributes so that you get attributes printing if you yourself select the attributes. So if you yourself apply templates to attributes, the default behavior is going to be to print them out. 
So you just, this allows us to essentially have a, a complete language whereby the behavior is defined for all types of nodes, even though in this case it doesn't matter by default. Other questions? Okay. Priorities. And again, this is slightly going, I think, ahead of where your own style sheets need to be at this point, but just an FYI so that you know what you can do in terms of features with this language. Know that in the application of templates is there also the notion of priority. Because you can certainly, even at this stage, come up with code of your own, I'm sure, where you have multiple templates that both match, could match, the same types of nodes. For instance, you could have a template that matches star, but you could also define yourself a template that matches quote unquote title. Now if you're parsing an XML document and you encounter a title node, which template should the processor apply? Well, it'd be sort of an annoying thing if like of some languages, the compiler just said, whoa, uh, you know, this is ambiguous, the signatures are effectively the same, I can't tease them apart, fix this. XSLT does not do that. It chooses for you which template to apply. So just intuitively, which template would you hope applied if you had a template that matched quote unquote star and a template that matched quote unquote title and you applied templates to say my blockbuster? Yeah. Title, why intuitively? Without turning to that little box to explain. It's just more specific, exactly. That's the precisely the intuition. So what this slide is meant to just hint at, and this box just shows some defaults effectively, and this probably confirms what you would hope would happen, the more specific your node test, the higher priority it's going to have. And that's sort of the rule of thumb you can use. So for instance, the sort of least useful node test you could use is just to say node, colon. All right, that's sort of a, you know, uninteresting statement because if you're applying templates to a node, of course it's a node. So that thing has the lowest priority of all. Text node too, same idea. But when you start to get a little higher and you specify something like foo, which in here, here means the name of an element or bar, the name of another element, that has higher priority, priority of what they call zero, but that's higher than 0.5. But if you are even more specific, and you can do this, although I would say this is a less of a common case, if you go so far as to define XSL template match equals quote unquote foo bracket one. Well first recall that bracket one is shorthand notation, if you haven't seen it before, for just position equals one. So sort of in array syntax, that just means the first foo element. So if you had a template that matched on that, that would only get applied to elements called foo that themselves happen to be the first foo element in any node set in question. So in, to put it in an example to it, if you had a whole bunch of foo elements in your file and you applied templates to them and you had a template that matched foo bracket one, you could have the behavior for the first foo element be different from that from all of the others. Okay? Not necessarily useful, certainly for problems we can imagine right now, but sort of confirms the intuition, right? The more specific you get, the higher the priority is going to be. That's all. That's the takeaway. Yeah? It doesn't seem to follow the same rule with regards to the namespace, though. It seems like the namespace follows through as a lower priority than just foo. Um, it seems to be a bit more specific if you say, you know, XSL colon foo versus just foo. So you can, like, override all of the namespace processing by putting in a foo there. It's true. And just to be clear, the the point here is that it, the name, uh, nodes that are prefixed with namespaces have by definition a lower priority. Um, the re one of the reasons for this is that if you're importing a style, if you're using someone else's style sheet for instance and they have like named elements, you by default don't want their style sheets kicking in before yours. And so in this way, are you able to, for instance, without defining, for instance, a namespace prefix for yourself, which is perhaps the common case when you're writing your own code, it allows you to avoid unexpected behavior by other people's overshadowing yours. But there are other tricks to redress that. For instance, we'll even see tonight there's the notion of including another style sheet, importing another style sheet, and those have implications for the priorities as well. So does that mean then if you import a style sheet and someone says, Correct. 
Correct, yeah. So to just recap, if you have another style sheet you're importing or including, they could have foo elements, but prefixed with a different namespace qualifier, essentially. And we'll, we'll see that again in just a second. And that second is now. So just the syntax, again, an FYI, to put the features out there before we start playing with them tonight, if you want to include another style sheet, you literally put this in you know, the top of your document. And what this effectively does, this is like sharp include in C or import in Java, just gives you access to the style sheet uh, that may be contained within another file. This is useful if you yourself want to start factoring out, for instance, little helper templates, so to speak, as you develop your own X2, My Blockbuster, or future work. If you want to have sort of the notion of separating some of your functionality into multiple files, really useful way to just keep your own code nice and neat rather than having one huge file with lots of templates. Um, realize, though, that if you use include, it has the same precedence as the style sheet that is including the file, which is to say that Whatever the priorities are in the included file, they're going to re retain those same priorities in your file. So beware and bear, bear in mind your understanding of priorities. If, however, and this is perhaps the more common case, if you're using someone else's style sheet or even your own and you want to override some of the templates you've already defined, well, if you use import, by definition, no matter the priorities of the <coughs> other style sheets uh, templates, they immediately get knocked down a peg when they're imported so that you can trust that your templates and your current style sheet will kick in before any of those get applied. Think of it as the priorities of any of the templates in the imported style sheet get multiplied by you know, 0.8 just so that they're lower than your own templates priorities. But that's sort of a misleading statement. So if you in your own style sheet um, defined matching on star mm -hmm. and then import something that matches on and so when you first you know, go through the document, you hit title, it would go to star in your own? Correct. I believe yours would just, even in that case, have higher priority because otherwise you have to get into an understanding of the numbers and so forth. And so yours just get looked at first. And if none of yours match, then the imported style sheet kicks in. But if you include, as with the previous syntax, then you have to bear in mind what those kinds of values are. So variables, so these are useful, and these are something you can start using with one caveat. Once you set a variable on XSLT, you may not change it. They are unmutable. It's a functional programming language, so you may have seen this in other languages, uh, like Lisp and so forth. When you bind a value to a variable, that's it. Um, it cannot change, so that you can have unexpected behavior, among other things. Uh, the syntax for defining a variable is as follows. You just give it a name, and you give it a value, and you assign its value by way of select. What this means is that if you want to, for convenience, be able to access a whole node set by way of some variable reference, we could define in our style sheet something like this. We could in our style sheet, you know what, say, I want to have access to a variable called XSL variable name, let's just call this movies. And just so that I don't have to always type the same expression again and again, or I just want to have quick access to this, I want to be able to change things around more easily for whatever your purpose is, you can, for instance, just select database slash movies slash movie. And what I now have in what will become dollar sign movies is just a reference to the node set containing all of those movie elements. And you can reuse this in other statements. And it's a useful thing because later in my file, if I want to do, for instance, a select during some iteration, I can say something like XSL value of select equals, you know what, let's select all of the titles of my movies. And you can do things like that. Okay, now in this case, realize I'm doing select the value of a node set and it's not going to quite work as you might expect. And I'll leave it to your own experimentation as to what happens when you try to select the value of a node set. And we've sort of seen this before already. But just realize that the takeaway for now is what you can do with these variables. Immediately your context becomes whatever the context is of that variable. And that's a useful thing, certainly. You can use them as the equivalent of constants as well if you want to select one piece of data and then use it a lot. Variables can be useful because, among other things, you, they can save the processor the inefficiency of grabbing the same kind of data again and again and again. If it can just do the query once and then retain a collection of nodes, a node set for you, it doesn't have to constantly reselect those. And you don't have to worry about uh, the processor being smart enough to figure out that you're repeating some query again and again. And you'll find 
One, because it's a relatively new language, certainly compared to other languages for which there is a lot more of a compiler history. Um, you'll realize that efficiency, I would say to this day, is more in the hands of the developer than is usual. You can't just assume that some smart people who wrote GCC or Java C can sort of figure out how to optimize your code, even if you didn't write it in necessarily the best way, if you've got some um, tail recursion and whatnot, the compiler will typically get rid of that and figure out how not to bother wasting stack space and so forth. In XSLT, I would give, just as a habit, yourself a lot more of the responsibility for optimizing your queries and avoiding typing more than you have to, querying more than you have to. Um, saying that is perhaps not terribly useful. You'll realize this yourself, perhaps. With Xtube, when you start trying to apply your style sheet to a two or three hundred kilobyte file, you do something stupid, you're going to be, you are going to be sitting there for two minutes while it executes. And that is the best reinforcement of all as to how much um, intelligent design um, matters when it comes to some of the larger data sets that you might apply your style sheets to. Otherwise, frankly, for the quick and dirty type applications, if you want to, for instance, uh, XSL for each, all right, well, perhaps one of those do as I say and not as I do, you know, this not an uncommon thing to type if you just want to very quickly get all the titles in a move in a data in a file and do something with them right this is the lazy man's approach because it searches literally the whole document if you don't care about cycles and you don't have a large input document it's probably going to take me less time to write this than it would be to type out the slightly longer query that though would be more efficient it's going to take me more human cycles to type it than it would for the processor to just go search the whole darn dom so design versus execution trade-off. And here we are, result tree fragments. And we introduce these in the context of variables because you often experience them, if at all, in the context of variables. If you do something like this, defining a variable, oh, and just to be clear, the other way that you can define a variable is not just to use select, but you can actually put the value in between the open tag and the start tag. And just to be further clear, if you want to select a literal, like uh, the word foo, quote unquote, you can't write select equals quote unquote foo. Because what is the implication? It's going to look for all of the nodes called foo that are children of your current node. Why? Because the child axis is implied, etc. Certainly seen that before. How do you select foo then? single quote, foo, single quote, inside of those double quotes, if you want to select a literal. And this is, a, bear in mind, because one of the useful things for variables, too, is perhaps just to set a number of constants, for instance. If you know all of your GIFs are in some path, but you want to uh, have the explicit path, for instance, in your image tags, if you're outputting a web page, well, it's often useful to factor out that kind of information into a constant, a variable in this case. But if you want to put, assign to an XSLT variable, a literal string, just be careful to quote it, literally. Yeah. I'm sorry? Are you going to cover scope and scope? Uh, ask it now. Let me see if it, it's better integrated elsewhere. For each loop, I find a variable in there that is named foo. And now I have an if, and I also have foo in there. Are those Ah, good question. So if you have foo already defined, and then inside an inner loop, you define a new instance of foo. I don't remember, to be honest. So we can try that, or I'll experiment during break. Um, you, it wouldn't reassign the same variable, but I don't remember if the spec says it should be an error. What I was seeing in the debugger was the first one was zero, and then when I got in here, it was nine and I wanted it to be, but then when I went to the top, it was zero. So that, okay, so that would be the behavior you should expect if it works at all, because once you bind a variable in XSLT again, you cannot change that particular variable. So, and then it sounds like this is confirming what we would hope, which is that it, you are allowed to create um, variables with a closer scope of the same name, but their values are lost. It's a new variable altogether in that scope. But I'll double check if that happens to be otherwise. Yeah? yeah I was asking, if, um, you said you could put a constant like a single quote. Would that work in both the top and the lower case? So you could put like a single quote around two within variable? Good question. So, just to summarize, if I wanted to select quote unquote foo with these different syntaxes, in the top I would have to do single quote foo. Here, I could just write foo. Or I could even do, um, if I wanted it to be an explicit text node, I could define a text node in there as well. But it would have no material effect in this case. 
Okay, bearing in mind now that you can define variables in this way, realizing too that the re one of the reasons this might be useful is because you could have a variable store the value of another template that gets invoked in between here, for instance. Well, if a template happens to output what you think of as nodes, turns out if you assign them to a variable in that way, in the latter case, you don't get back a set of nodes. You get back what's called a result tree fragment. So to simplify the scenario, suppose that I try to define a variable called oogle there, and I literally just type out foobar, baz, bar, quark, quark, and so forth, which if you sort of uh, sketch it out as a DOM, it looks like what I have there is a little subtree whose root element is foo, so what I would hope would happen is that inside of dollar sign oogle now is a single node called foo that has a child called bar and another child called quux. So it's sort of like a three node tree at that point. And then there's some text nodes below that. Turns out not the case. You do not get back a node set. If you assign a variable of value like this or equivalently you invoke a template in here that returns or generates output like this much like you've been generating XHTML using templates, the value, the, t the t data type of that variable is what's called an RTF, result tree fragment. The implication of which is that you cannot now iterate over the nodes returned. That is to say, if I have a variable called oogle with that value, I cannot, for instance, now say XSL value of select oogle slash uh, foo, what was it? Foo slash bar to get back, quote unquote, baz. Because oogle is not a node set, even though it looks like one. So it's sort of this weird data type that's sort of a you know, incomplete implementation of the behavior you would hope for. And this is one of those things that I promised we would allude to, XSLT2 fixes this problem, such that if you have syntax like this, Google is in fact a node set with one node called foo, beneath which are children nodes called bar and quux, beneath which are text nodes with those values, bar and, or baz and double quux. So again, this too is just a beware for now. And it isn't necessarily going to trip you up, especially if you get into the habit of defining variables in the first case, which does give you a node set if you use select. It's only when you start doing things like this that you run into, for our purposes, these RTFs. So just beware. Now, there is recourse, and we'll conclude part of tonight with a mention of this. There exists, with a lot of XSLT processors, what are called extension functions. And these are sort of add-ons, similar in spirit to what some uh, folks in the browser world have done, where even though it's not part of, say, the HTML or XHTML spec, you can do certain things with a browser. For instance, uh, Internet Explorer lets you control the colors and look of scroll bars. Firefox does not. Well, that's because that's like an IE-only extension, so to speak. Um, or it might be the other way around, actually. Similarly, in XSLT, two, in XSLT, have some processors taken upon themselves to expose additional functionality that's not in the XSLT spec. And these are generally called extension functions. And these are actually generally a very useful thing. One, because these, this language is still somewhat in its infancy. And two, sometimes you just want to use this language, but you really need other functionality. You can go so far with extension functions to implement your own in, say, Java, and then invoke those methods in your style sheet using what are called extension functions. And that's a very powerful thing if you can write a bit of Java code to then be invoked by way of your style sheet. Yeah? Is that how you would pay for implementation? Yes. That, though, is the price you pay. You become tied to a particular implementation of XSLT. Zalin is, again, one of the sort of the de facto standards. So using something like Zalin's extension functions, whose direction I will point you in, probably is a reasonable thing to do. Um, but just beware if you go with, say, lesser known processors that might do some wonderful things for you. Just beware the portability of your code. Okay, other questions? All right. Um, and I put these up here to, uh, let's just say, uh, the same applies just FYI with uh, RTFs when you have parameters. 
which we glanced at last week but won't spend too much time on just yet. Um, they also come into play when you do things like copy of and value of. We'll come back to the first of those later. But just realize, as before, if we have Google defined in this way and we select Google, what you get back is not um, what you get back is not an actual node set. You just get what text is in between the nodes there. But it, the short of it is, don't worry too much about RTFs. Just realize that if you get some seemingly anomalous behavior when developing your own style sheets, at that point, ask yourself, all right, what are the data types at play here? And is that perhaps influencing the behavior? But otherwise, I wouldn't worry too much about having those, uh, getting too comfortable with those. But a useful trick to bear in mind that we'll use <coughs> after break to play around is the copy and copy of elements. These just let you copy nodes from your input document. The first copy does a shallow copy. It just copies the current element. That's pretty much it to the output. A copy of does a copy of children and attributes, which is sort of a deeper copy. If then we wanted to, this is for the perhaps the geeker among you, could you implement copy of using copy? Well, the answer to that trivia question would be this here. And I won't dwell on it for now because the syntax is unnecessarily, it will lead us off on a tangent, which I, probably isn't terribly enlightening. But if you can understand this after tonight, you know, in a few days when you're thinking you have some time to kill and you want to ask yourself the XSLT trivia, if you can understand this after first understanding those three built-in templates, I think you can consider yourself quite, uh, becoming quite savvy with XSLT and quite quickly at that. Outputting nodes. This we, I think we discussed briefly in section last week. How do you actually output nodes? Well, we've seen in our own examples, if you don't prefix a tag with like XSL colon, it's going to be outputted literally, which means if in your XSLT for Bly Blockbuster, you just say open bracket A, href equals quote unquote, you're literally going to get that in the output document. But sometimes it's useful or more clear or even necessary to explicitly output elements. And you can do this by way of XSL's elements and attribute and comment and so forth elements, which just explicitly tell the processor, generate a new node of this type. Now, even though you, for the most part, aren't seeing trees and DOMs and so forth in the application of XSLT to XML, do bear in mind that underneath the hood, what's going on is you're taking one input tree and applying it to another input tree and producing an output tree. It just so happens that you, the human, tend to see the serialized result of that whole process. You're not seeing the output tree. You're seeing the serialized flat file of XHTML. But in RAM, was that output document actually another DOM or equivalent? And that's why we do speak in terms of outputting element nodes and attribute nodes. To you, they look like open bracket A href. Inside the machine, though, is there really an object in memory of type element with uh, attributes hanging off of it, much like our DOM discussion. So just bear that in mind. And just to wrap up, what we'll do after break is our suite of demos and, and explorations. Attribute value templates are perhaps one of the most useful bits of syntax to bear in mind, especially if you're finding your style sheets from my blockbuster already a bit unwieldy. Uh, if you simply want to output the value of a variable or a certain node in the current context, you don't necessarily have to use XSL value of all of the time. In fact, that can get um, challenging because consider this example here. Suppose I want to output clearly an image element for a web page. Well, suppose that you want to output as the value of the source attribute uh, the name of the GIF and the path there too. Well, how would you do that? Well, based on the examples we've seen last week, we can just do open bracket image source equals quote unquote, uh-oh, what would your instinct be at that point? probably to use XSL value of, which is how we've been getting at the values of certain nodes. But what's the problem in this context? It's an attribute, source is, but what's the real problem in terms of well-formedness and all of that? Right, you, I mean, you know from my first parser, you're already inside of a tag. You can't have another tag inside of a tag, even though in spirit that's what you want. Right, the point is that ideally we just want to do XSL value of right there and just use the lessons we've been preaching all along, value of here. The problem though is that you're already inside of a tag or an element that's being generated. So what's the verbose solution? Well, to remember your XSLT 
reference, which is this, to say, oh, wait a minute, I just won't output the tag raw in this form by writing a literal open bracket image source. I'll just output, just to make it clear, I'll just type something like this. All right, I want an image tag, so I just say XSL element, name equals image, and then inside of this element, I want to hang an attribute called uh, source, and then the value of this thing, hmm, I could do select if I, whoops, not there. So the value of this thing, all right, well, I'm going to do this, XSL attribute. Now I can do XSL value of, and at this point, I can say, you know, whatever the URL is, or if it's dollar sign URL, we'll ignore that detail for now. And now I have my A, or my open bracket image source equals quote unquote, whatever the URL is of that image. That just took me like 20 seconds to type, and it's certainly not terse. How can you do this better? Well, attribute value template, which ironically even takes longer to say than to type, allows you to use the squiggly brace notation to simply get at data you want without the overhead of what we just went through. So rather, this is completely valid. So notice that at the top of this excerpt, we've selected a literal quote unquote slash images, right? So that's like a constant I've defined so I can use it throughout, reuse it throughout my style sheet. And I've called it image dir. Well, here's a template that matches photography elements. So for every photography element or photograph element in my input file, I want to output, it seems, an image tag. That's sort of a reasonable thing intuitively. Well, I could jump through the hoops of all that syntax or I could simply start typing literally image source equals quote unquote, what do I want? Well, the context node is what? Of what type of node? It's a photograph element. Well, implicitly, it looks like what I uh, looks like. I want to put here, or intuitively, I want to put the image dir value, and I'm getting at that by way of the variable. So it works for variables. A literal slash. Notice I'm outside the curly braces. But then, what is href apparently? Perfect. It's a apparently a child element of the photograph element. Right? You're seeing this out of context, but if you just glance down, here's the snippet that we're assuming we're applying it to. And indeed, href is a child element of photograph. So when we do, ignore all of this, because this now is just confusing, I think. So look at quote, ignore, squiggly brace, href, close squiggly. Well, what's the current context node? Well, it's photograph, because that's the template we're in. Well, if we just say href, that's like saying child colon colon href. And that, in turn, is like saying grab the href child of the current photograph. But wait a minute, we don't want the element here. We want the value. But wait a minute, what have we said is the value of an element? Right, it's a concatenation of all of its textual descendants. Well, we know, because we know what the file looks like, what is that equivalent to? It's equivalent to the value of the single text node beneath the href attribute. So it simply suffices to just say href close squiggly, rather, for instance, than the ver more verbose href slash text open parenthesis close parenthesis, which would select the text nodes beneath it, if any. Finally, with, we do the same trick adding in the bit about uh, the attribute with. So with equals quote unquote squiggly size slash at with. Well, what's with? It's another, uh, what's size rather? It's another child of photograph. So the same logic applies. Slash at with means it's an attribute of whatever that current node is, which means we get out 300. So again, maybe a little complicated if you sort of overthink it. But if you just glance at it and sort of get a little comfortable with the idea of these relative location paths, all you're doing is sort of in the most efficient way possible grabbing the data you want without having to do the overhead of all of those XSLT elements that exist and are necessary in some cases. But so long as we support this sort of you know, un-XML-like syntax of squiggly braces, it actually gets the job done better than the more formal notation would. So Yes, so the squiggly braces, if you use them inside of attributes, as we are here, with and source, then yes, it's like you're typing XSL value of, but working around the problem of nesting tags. Yeah? The, the image dash dir mm -hmm. is the 
variable which is established in the first line there. Correct. Image store is the variable established in line one. And you're selecting forward slash images. Doesn't that imply that that's a sub node? Careful. It's literal. Single quotes are around the slash images. So yes, if I didn't have those single quotes, I would be actually selecting all images children of the root of the document. But because it's literally quoted with single quotes inside of double quotes, that's a string, not a node set. And so in this case, though we've downplayed the role of data types, there it's important to recognize that is a string. It's not a node set because we single quoted it. All this is now is a literal copy paste. So dollar sign image dir is exactly slash images now, literally. So squiggly dollar sign image dir close squiggly literally gets deleted and replaced with slash images. So doesn't that take you, wouldn't that take you to an image child? Would that take us to an image child? No, because literally this is happening the squiggly braces are telling us, and because we have a dollar sign variable, it's literally doing a substitution, but of a string. So because we use single quotes, that is a string, and the processor will not interpret it as a node set. So even though it's being replaced, it's replacing dollar sign image dir here, that's it. It's a string. The processor will not try to evaluate it as with an eval function. Uh, what's the significance? It's because in the HTML world, all of these JPEGs are in a slash images directory. That's all. This is a file system issue now, not a location path issue. Right? If my goal is to generate HTML like this, it just so happens that all these images are in slash images. So I literally want slash images in the output, not some kind of node set. And that's why I'm using a literal string. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, and to be clear, and it's perhaps my fault for not setting it up properly, assume that this database of photographs simply tells us the names of the photographs and the relative sizes, and all of them are assumed to be in the same directory on our web server. Okay. All right, so let's pause, take a five-minute break, and we'll resume with some demos. of additional syntactical and feature details just so you have them in your arsenal after which we'll leave most of our experience with XSLT to actual experimentation on the projects rather than to additional my pushing information at you. You can access multiple source documents, that is multiple in XML documents from a style sheet. This is to say even though the model is to apply one style sheet to one XML file, you can include effectively in the style sheet other XML files if you want to sort of draw data from multiple files and the way you can do that in XSLT itself is to just use um, a variable, give it a name, but then use the document function and literally if I put in document quote unquote foo.xml that would store the contents of foo.xml in a variable called whatever I name it. What does it mean to store the contents of the file? Really what that means is that if, this, if I say uh, var is the name of my variable, what that means is dollar sign $var will, take, will become a node set with probably one node, and that one node is the root element of the input document, or rather, what dollar sign $var will become is a node set containing the root of the document slash from the input file. But beneath that will be all of the descendants of the root of the second document. So let's put this into context. If I then in my style sheet want to have access, maybe at the top here, XSL variable, I'm going to call this, um, let's just say for kicks I want to integrate my blockbuster with Xtube for no compelling reason um, or sensical reason here. I'm going to give this variable a name called Xtube. And what I'm going to do is select document, quote unquote, literal quotes this time, xtube.xml. Now what I can do in my template if I really wanted to is I could do things like XSL value of 
select equals dollar sign x tube. What that means now is that I now have as my context node slash in xtube.xml. So if I really wanted to be lazy, I could just say slash slash station name. And what that would do is select the value of the first station name. And that incidentally is what happens when you do XSL value of on a node set, what you get back is the value of the first node in the node set. So perhaps a more common scenario would be to say something like for each. So now what I'm doing is iterating over not station node elements in my current file, which is my blockbuster.xml, but rather all of the station names that I grabbed from xtube.xml. So it's a way of integrating, if you will, data sources using XSLT itself and the document function. Okay. Um, finally, just so it's, it's obvious, so recursive descent parsing is what we glanced at last week as the fundamental definition as to what's going on in XSLT document. These templates, just to be clear, are by nature recursive, assuming that apply templates is going on. And those built-in templates we discussed, just bear in mind the recursiveness that is jump-started by those templates. And here we are at the extension function. So these are two URLs which will lead you, if of interest, to extension functions provided by Zalin specifically. Um, you can not only define your own extension functions, but access a suite of existing functions, at least from Zalin, one of which for XSLT 1.0 is wonderfully useful. It's a, an extension function called node set, which converts an RTF to a node set if you happen to struggle with that issue we alluded to earlier with uh, RTFs and so forth. So there exists a Zalin specific solution for converting what we know now as an RTF to an actual node set that you can traverse with location paths and so forth. There are a bunch of other extension functions. I, for instance, have used in a research project a couple of years ago an entire math library. So you do have some math in XSLT, right? You've seen plus and less than and equals than and, and uh, equals and so forth. Well, I needed uh, sine and cosine and tangent. Why? Um, the problem at hand, just to sort of give you a sort of a fun instance of where XSLT was actually a really useful language to deploy, what I wanted to do was the following. This is a graphic depicting the floor plan of Maxwell Dworkin, which is the computer science building on campus. So it's an unusual shaped building and all of these are offices and this is the third or so floor. What we had a few years ago and they still use now was what's called a wireless sensor network, which is a whole, uh, a couple hundred tiny wireless devices with fairly limited CPU power and radio strengths and batteries that would intercommunicate and create a sort of mesh network using wireless signals throughout the building. We wanted to weigh at the time to be able to monitor the relative signal strengths of these nodes. All of these little devices could be pulled via serial port and via ethernet cables and so forth so that we could just ask them, what's your current signal strength reading from from the packets you're receiving. So essentially they can give us data. Well, I wanted to dynamically every night or every hour generate a visualization of the relative signal strengths because looking at a big table of numbers not terribly enlightening to a human. So my vision at the time was to, because there were nodes all over this thing, just have lines whereby when packets were sent from A to B, if it was a really strong signal, I wanted to put like a green line saying this is really good signal strength. If it was really weak, I wanted to see a red line. If it was sort of okay, I wanted to see a yellow line. Just so that we could visualize our building and say, all right, you know what, we should move this node here, this node here, and this is where we should bolster our wireless signal strength. So the solution I ended up using at the time, though you can do this in other languages certainly, was I wrote a little script that would grab from the serial port of these devices just the raw numbers of signal strength and then I just plop them into XML format. You know, a quick and dirty XML file, nothing interesting at all. Then I whipped up a style sheet that would iterate over the nightly dump of XML data, which again just contained, you know, nodes called uh, device ID equals quote unquote one, and then it's signal strength, all of the metadata that I wanted. I whipped up a style sheet that processed that XML file and then generated what's called SVG, scalable vector graphics. Scalable vector graphics is what we'll be looking at next week, albeit digitally. Um, and what I wanted to do ultimately was create a graphical overlay on this thing. So the kinds of data I ended up working with was this. I had in this one XML file, um, called moats, these things, these sensor nodes are called moat. 
me go ahead and open motes.xml. So this was a file that I was using as an input document and it gave every mode an ID and it also showed the location and the floor number and the pixel location on that map. And this was certainly somewhat labor intensive because we physically had planted the nodes, we physically wanted to mark on the maps where they were. It was the dynamic part that we wanted to leave, that what was dynamic about the project was these signal strengths which would vary over the day. So this is just some of the static content. What I would also have nightly act, uh, coming to me is a file like this which was dumped from the serial ports and this was the quick and dirty XML file I whipped up so I just called this a row set and a row and then in each row I had a source ID which is the moat that data came from the destination node and then the mean RSSI which was essentially a signal strength reading and the count the number of packets that were actually received now you might actually be familiar with this format this was quick and dirty and then I let MySQL output this for me. So the infrastructure we had in place was that at night, software would pull these wireless devices, dump the data into a MySQL database because it was also being presented on the web and some other formats. So we already had an infrastructure in play. Turns out you can pass a flag to MySQL to dump out the rows in your tables in XML format, in a standard format where it's result set, row, 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 and then the field names become the child elements thereof. Wonderfully useful and straightforward. So I could easily generate this without even writing more than one line of code, which was just to sell MySQL, just dump the data as XML. So finally, all that remained for me to do was to whip up the style sheet. And the style sheet, we won't go through the details, looked like this. So this style sheet, and notice I'm using some parameters, which is an idea familiar to you if only from uh, B2B time, where we're using parameters for the style sheet. Um, there's XSL output. We, I used an XSL key to expedite lookups, which we'll come back to. Then I have a template, and then I was choosing to output either SVG or XHTML. I forget at the time if I had stolen this framework from E259, or if it was because of this project that E259 has that framework. Um, but ultimately, just to give you a teaser of SVG, I started outputting using this XSLT elements like the following. And you'll see in SVG, there's things like G for group, uh, image so that I can embed the overlays and so forth. And just to make a long story short, the extension functions I used, I believe, were, let's see if I can find them again. Yeah, so things like this. Because you can use actual Java code, I was using Java Lang integer to hex string to generate the, I think, the color codes that I wanted for the various lines and so forth. I was also later using sine and cosine because this is a weird sort of geek problem from if you really like geometry in high school, it's very easy to draw a line from point A to B if you know their coordinates, right? It's a uh, slope. But if you want to have bi-directional lines, so one's going this way, one's going the other way, it's very easy to have two lines lying on top of one another, but not terribly useful if it's red in one direction and green in the other, because you only see one. So the problem, the geeky problem here, was I wanted to have dual lines, but offset by three pixels, and to do that in any relative location means you need trigonometry. So with XSLT and trig, that I end up generating, finally, using this XSLT, a graphic like the following. So what we would get each night, it's not necessarily pretty, but it's not the prettiest building either, but the green depicts strong hops between A's and B's. Yellow was a little weak. As it becomes orange, it was getting a little weaker. Perhaps the leak, weakest link we had was here. So perhaps not surprising because it's a pretty good distance across several doorways and so forth. These are very cheap and weak devices, so their range is not great. But every night, as a result of dumping the MySQL data as XML, running Zalin with a cron job against uh, my style sheet against that XML file. We got an SVG file that laid itself on top of the ping that I showed you earlier. And then we had this presenting on a web page dynamically. So just some of the tricks that you can use, honestly, even after just picking up a little bit of this. And my little tangent on the trigonometry and so forth really is tangential. The takeaway there, though, is that what you can do even beyond the scope of XSLT with extension functions, not only trig, but things like java.lang and any class that you yourself might implement, any static methods you might have. It's really kind of cool. Yeah. So is the geometry sort of based on some sort of world coordinate system so that you could sort of potentially 
In this case, well, SVG itself, as the name suggests, is um, scalable vector graphics. So actually, this thing does scale perfectly. The larger I made the underlying image, everything would line up nicely. So the trig that I was using was just to get the angles of these lines correct. But they, too, would scale if the image got bigger and bigger. So just kind of neat. It was a fun little exercise, but really suggests that you can do a lot with XSLT. It is a programming language. So I would refer you to um, those URLs, for instance, just to start. No expectation, no requirement, no need fundamentally to use extension functions in Project 2. You're welcome to, so long as they're Zalin extension functions, just because that's what we're expecting use of. Um, but probably those are the kinds of extension functions you would want to use in the first place, if not your own, just because of support. So, some demonstrations and some reinforcements of some of this stuff. So, in tonight's examples directory, we have a bunch of files. Um, the first one of which is called titles1.xsl. I'm going to go ahead and open that in stylus here. And this is sort of an easy one, because we looked at this last week. So this was just to remind you of some of the simple types of queries we did last week. This was our use of iteration, matching on the root element, and outputting just a very simple web page um, that wasn't even a complete web page, since I don't even have the HTML tags. But I just wanted to output a list of the titles. So this should be pretty, you should be pretty comfortable with now, I would say. In titles2.xsl, which could similarly be applied to my blockbuster.xml. Notice that we're doing things in a little more interesting way. So this is just to show you by way of example some of the additional things that we can do. Let's, a good exercise perhaps is to start by asking what does this do? Or more interestingly, how does it do it? So the comments sort of get us started. This is the one template. Here's another template, and it looks like this is a name template. So what we didn't spend time on last week was using name templates and invoking them explicitly. So let's try that. So here we have a template. Matches the root, which means because there's no other in this file, that's the guy that's going to start the whole process. What do we do? Looks like we're defining a variable called movies, just as I did earlier, so I can have quick, quick access to the movie elements in the file. Finally, or next, I'm calling the template called print titles. And explicitly this time, tonight, am I passing in a parameter called nodes with the value of movies. So in effect, and you could do this many different ways, and you'll find this in XSLT as with other languages, you can implement the same ideas in many, many ways, no one necessarily better than the other. But this sort of reiterates some of the stuff we've been doing tonight and shows you how you can pass in a whole node set. Well, this goes to print titles. What's print titles? Notice a template either matches or it is named at least so far as we've seen now. So here's the name template print titles. We specify that it takes a parameter called nodes. Now we have a value of what? What's this doing for us? Ah, perfect. It's selecting the title of the first node. Well, why is that? Well, dollar sign nodes refers to the parameter passed in which, if you scroll back in the story, is just all of the movie elements in the file. So to say dollar sign nodes, that is movie, bracket one. This is shorthand for position equals one. So that's the first movie element slash title. So the first movie's title. Output that with value of. Output a line break. And now here's the interesting part. And this, again, is to illustrate some of the features here. Not necessarily the only way to solve this problem, and it's perhaps um, <laughs> A more complicated way of doing it, but it illustrates the power of XSLT and its inherent use of recursion. Now I'm going to do this, or a, a, an explicit use of recursion. If count of nodes, crazy thing, one, what is this saying? So if the node set is of size two or more, that is we have more titles to print, what do we want to do? Well, let's call ourselves print titles with the parameter, but which nodes? Only those nodes at position two and higher. So all the nodes such that the predicate of position greater than one. So all of those nodes whose indices are two or higher, where i is you know, two or greater, get passed in as the new parameter. Well, what happens then? 
Well, we call, we've just called ourselves recursively. Our node set is now of size n minus 1. We print the first title. Then we pass in n minus 2 nodes to ourselves. Then n minus 3 nodes. Then n minus 4 nodes until finally we bottom out and the XSL, tip, it, XSL if does not evaluate to true. So we bottom out, base case, and the call stack goes away. And what have we done? We've recursively printed out all of the titles of movie elements in the file in document order. Just a different way of doing what we've otherwise been doing as in titles 1.xsl with a for each. But suggestive of what you can do here. Position does not increment. Position tells you what the position of the current node in question is. Good comment though. But it does go back to the first node, but we've passed in a smaller node set. So basically you move to the next node? Effectively, yes, because we're passing in initially all of the movie elements. Then we print out this guy, and I pass in only these elements, print this guy, pass in only these elements, print him, pass these, these, these. Finally, there's no one left, and we're done. So we just keep recursing, passing in a smaller and smaller input, which is what sort of recursion tends to be about after all anyway biting off smaller and smaller equivalent problems. Okay, another example and one that perhaps would have been useful on project one is a solution to the problem of attribute conversion. So part of project one was to actually use Xerxes and using probably a SAX parser convert your input files attributes to what? Child elements. Okay, so just so that we can sort of tie these two threads together, how could we do this in XSLT? Well, let's take a look. And a lot of this is comments in white space, even though it looks long. So let's, let's take a look. Top of the file, we've got some of the copy-paste stuff, just output format. Uh, and then we've got our root template. And we've got some other templates. But I'll spoil the story and say that the one that's going to apply first is, in fact, this one. There's no, no trick questions here. All right. So we match the root of our document. And we explicitly call a template I just called converter. What do we pass to it? I pass in all of the children of the current node. Okay, so child colon colon node, everything. All right, what happens now? Well, we're pretty much done with that part of the story, so now we can focus on converter. How does this attribute converter work? Well, it takes the perimeter called nodes, that was sort of obvious, and now we've got one of those if, else, if, else, if, else, ifs, but it's called choose when, 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 otherwise. Okay, but it's an if, else, it's a branch construct. If the node in question is a comment. What am I doing with it? Just print it. And I could actually use something like XSL copy, which we alluded to earlier, but this is another way of doing it, perhaps more familiar to us right now. Print out the comment, but make sure it stays a comment, a comment node specifically. What if it's a PI? What do I do? Good, printing it as well, but as a PI, and remember from our lecture two or so, a PI has both a name and a value. So to output a PI, I need to give it a name, and I'm using our new attribute value trick, attribute value template trick. Now I'm giving it a value of itself, and that's all. Again, we won't dwell too much on PIs, but just realize the syntax is there, even though they might not be all that commonly used. And here's the magic. It's in the otherwise that we handle the rest. Now notice I'm not handling attributes as its own case otherwise. Well, what can be child nodes? Only in this case, PIs, comments, and elements, right? Attributes themselves would not be children of the root, which is why they don't have their own explicit case. We do have a case though for elements, which is handled by this. All right, so otherwise, what do I want to do? The goal at hand again is to convert all attributes to child elements. But that certainly means I need to retain the current element. So let's start retaining it. Output the element and give it the same name as it's already got. So this function name just returns the name of the current node. And that's exactly what we want. All right, now what do I do? I'm just going to iterate over all of the attributes. I could say at star, or I could explicitly say attribute colon colon star. Same thing, more explicit. What do I do for each attribute belonging to the current element I output a new element with that name and that value. Where name here, because we're selecting a node set of attributes, the name is going to be the name of that attribute and dot is going to be the value of that attribute. Though I could say value 
parenthesis, close parenthesis, but uh, tedious. So dot suffices. And close element. And now notice, why is this a child element? Well, I'm still inside of this element. So any elements I create inside this nesting structure are going to become children by nature. Now I've just converted all of the attributes in three lines of XSLT to child elements. But I'm not done, because I need to recurse on the document. Right? I'm at an element node. What if he has children? I need to get at those children. So I call myself with the parameter of my children, passing in not just star, because again, here's where that distinction is important. Star technically means all nodes of the quote unquote. I'll give you principal, but sure. All right, the stupid detail, principal node type, which almost always is elements, but not if we're trying to convert a document retaining all of it except the attributes. We want to select child colon colon node so that we don't throw away what? Comments and PIs. All right, so that's why I'm not using principal node type here. I'm really using node. So hopefully that's perhaps more clear as to why there's that distinction. So there's the recursion. That just calls now myself on all my children, which means that recursiveness will go figure out what other attributes need to be converted to nodes. So if I run this, for instance, on a file, let's go ahead and create a little dummy file here. Let's do new uh, XML document. And I'm just going <laughs> to, that's a useful feature. Foo, would anyone like to watch an online video demonstration? All right, I guess that's what, ironically, what people right now are doing as they watch that on video. All right, so foo, let's give bar a value of baz and quux a value of double quux, and that's it for a demo. All right, so simple file. I'm going to go back to my converter, associate it with, oh, I've got to save this. So we'll call this untitled one. I'm going to associate the style sheet using stylus with that XML file. Zalen, just change your command prompt just as project, one had, project two has advised. And now I'm going to execute this thing. And now notice, Stylus gives us a nice GUI version. If I look at the source version, look at that, project one implemented in a few lines of XSLT. Can we do better? Well, it wouldn't be nearly as good of a demonstration if we didn't. I give you attribute converter 2.xsl, which tackles the same problem, but in a different way, a way that is perhaps more of the, what we call the push approach instead of pull. Attribute converter one, to be clear, had that for each, where we're just iterating over all the children, and we're just pulling the data we want, and then recursing on the stuff we didn't get to, the child elements. Well, what if we just define really more in accordance with the spirit of XSLT, which is all about defining templates, 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 and just letting them get applied, however is appropriate. Can we take that approach? Well, here we go. I've got my first template up here, which matches the root, and I explicitly say, apply templates, select equals child, and child colon colon node. All right, so it just jump starts the whole process, right? Go figure out what templates to apply. What templates get applied? Well, remember what this document is. This is my foo document now, which is the root node. So if foo is my root element, the first child of slash is gonna be foo. So which of these templates is gonna apply when I apply templates? First one, right, because it's matching star, which denotes elements in this case, right? But in contrast to this node test, which matches text nodes, and this node test, which matches PIs, and I think there's another one for comments. Well, match star. What do we do? We've just matched an element, so let's output a new element called the same thing, identical to before. Now let's iterate over the attributes, just as we did before. Let's output a new element for each attribute, just like before. And now we're going to skip namespace issues because it's hard to generate namespace nodes uh, like this. Uh, XSLT2 fixes this and lets you uh, uh, output namespace nodes, but we're not going to dwell on that for now. Um, but we do need to worry about children. But you know what? Let's not explicitly call a template, right? Because that was sort of a non-XSLT. That was more of a func uh, procedural programming approach to call a template. Just let the processor figure out who to invoke next. So apply templates on the children. Okay, who was a child of foo in our sample document? Oops, no one. All right, so actually this is a very quick application 
Let's just fast forward then to a situation if we actually had some text nodes and some PIs and comments, well, they're actually just like before. In fact, I don't really need this because remember, I get this one for free. This is just a copy paste of one of those built-in templates. So I could just rely on that one anyway. Because remember, the default behavior for text nodes is just to dump them. That's why we very often just get these big screen dumps of data if we just select value of something. So what does this do? Let me just run this once. So I'm going to associate attribute converter 2.xsl with the same dummy file. Apply it. And as you might expect, done. Output, same length. The code, though, just to be clear, rather than iterating over, rather than explicitly invoking templates with call template, is letting the processor figure out by way of the nature of matching and priorities and all that stuff that we formalized tonight, which templates to apply to which nodes because we jump-started the process by telling it which templates or which nodes to apply templates to. Uh, yeah? Oh, what if you had like, C data? What happens to that? If you had C data, it would be part of um, text node, but an unparsed text node. So it would just become the value without itself being parsed. So you just see the part of it and you just get the contents? Correct. Correct. You would just get the data portion, which is everything after the open slash bracket C data. Would you have to explicitly test for it? No. What would happen is they would end up in the C data would end up in the text nodes with those weird tags stripped off. So if you wanted to retain the C data. I have to confirm this, but I don't think you can explicitly because the C data um, declarations are, a hint, are an instruction to the parser to not parse this content, but treat it as character data, aka text, and therefore put it in a text node. If you then wanted to avoid escaping it, I think you would yourself have to explicitly reintroduce the C data tags. It's possible, but I'm not sure if there's a way to test or pull the parser and ask, was this escaped, was this parsed or not? It might be hidden to the, pro to the uh, developer. No, actually, C data is wonderfully useful, actually, um, if only partially for lazy man purposes, but partially to deal with the real world issues like um, HTML development. For instance, a website I've been working on recently uses Ajax to actually grab data from a database and it, want, it ultimately is going to update a web page with some dynamically generated data. You can use JavaScript and with DOM calls similar in spirit to these XSL element calls, you could dynamically create anchor tags and image tags and so forth in JavaScript, but it's much easier, frankly, to just generate it on the server and say PHP or something and then just give the browser the HTML to just insert into the web page with like the inner HTML uh, feature of a, a DOM element. If that's the case, you don't usually want to have HTML, raw HTML or JavaScript code in an XML file, so you slap C data sections around it. Oh, I see. It's a good question. I will have to check if there's a hint provided to the parser. So I'll take a look. Well, well yes. So is it more efficient? Um, it can be if you're explicitly selecting the path um, that the processor should use to find those nodes. Yes, it absolutely could be. However, we could have been ex in this case, though, it doesn't really matter because the purpose of this style sheet is to recurse over the whole document. So we're touching all of the nodes anyway. If, however, we wanted to avoid this sort of recursive, exhaustive search of the tree, when you apply templates, you can just explicitly select, as we effectively are, what nodes you want to apply things to. 
So um, efficiency isn't necessarily uh, a concern because you can be explicit with both types of approaches. In fact, let's see if we can't whittle a solution down to something smaller. I give you the third and final solution to Project One's attribute converter in XSLT. Here's how you can do it in just, what, eight or so lines of code. Right. Step one, at version one had call templates. Step uh, version two had this sort of push approach of just defining templates for the nodes in question. I'm going to go one step further, still use that template-based approach where we leave it to the processor to apply them. I'm going to match all types of nodes, but what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to perform a copy, which again, XSL copy just does a shallow copy of the current node, that is its element, uh, its name, effectively. But inside of the copy I'm in creating, I'm going to first, before I finish outputting, whatever this node is, I'm going to first iterate over all of its attributes. Now if it's an element, could have some attributes. If it's a PI, this is going to return an empty node set, no big deal. There's nothing to iterate over. If it's comment, similarly, nothing to iterate over. It's just going to be an empty node set. It doesn't break, it's just no iterations will happen. So if it is an element, I'm iterating over all of the attributes, and for each attribute, well, this part's easy. We've seen this before. Finally, I apply templates. Before finishing this node's copying, I apply templates to his children so that the recursion happens before I close off this element. And so in short, what this does effectively is copy every node in the document, but before finishing the copy of an element specifically, it iterates over all of its attributes, outputs them as new children, and then recurses on its children and does the same thing. And so the more comfortable you get with XSLT, and I think the more exposure one has to the different types of syntax and elements, you can really start to do some elegant things that are still straightforward, at least to a learned eye, but in terms of implementation are just so much quicker to implement. Does it yeah. Come out in reverse order? Does it come out in reverse order? No. They'll come out in document order. Well, that's sort of a misleading statement. Attributes don't really have an order. The parser can return them in any order it feels like. Alphabetical, reverse alphabetical, the order it found them, doesn't, there's no uh, promise made. It's a good comment. Um, so because you're doing this recursively, doesn't that effectively output the last node first in, if you were printing? So we're not printing nodes, we're creating nodes, which means we are recursively creating a tree structure. So as we recurse, we're literally creating nodes that are hanging off of the parent nodes. It's unlike a typical recursive case in, say, Java or C, where you might be saying printf or cout or system.println, that sort of thing. There are no side effects in XSLT, too. In XSLT, here. We're creating nodes. Finally, the last file among tonight's files is this type checker just to give you confirmation of the fact that there are different data types in XSLT2 and why and how you might actually be able to, rather not data types, types of nodes, and just show you how you can actually test for this. Well, we effectively implicitly tested whether node was an attribute node a moment ago by just iterating blindly over them. And if there are any, we'll deal with them. If there aren't, not our problem, because we can trust that an XML parser only put attributes there if it was an element. Right? These are assumptions you can make because they are what's consistent with well-formedness. So this is a template that matches on the root. It goes ahead and just outputs some raw text. This is just a little utility program we whipped up, counts, and then it just displays this list of all of the total types of nodes in the document. So again, lazy man's approach, but sort of okay because I'm searching the whole document anyway, but the point anyway isn't to be efficient, it's just to be informative. So how do you count the number of comment nodes in the tree in the input document? We'll just call count on all nodes that pass the node test of comment, open parenthesis, close parenthesis. Right? And descendant or self means all of those get checked. How do we find all the PI? Same thing. Text nodes, same thing. Element nodes, same thing. Uh, what about the attributes? You have to be careful. You have to explicitly state the axis here, can't just say star, obviously, and namespace, same issue. Namespace nodes hang off of uh, nodes just like attributes do, effectively. And then this part here just dumps the comment, uh, the contents of the file. And then down here, we check the type. So what's going on? First, let's visualize what happened. I'm going to go ahead and apply this to my blockbuster.xml. 
the numbers of elements and such of which you are not expected to be familiar with. But if I run this, so I get some ugly web-based output. But if I view it as text over here, what you see is just some ASCII text. And what we have apparently, excuse me, in my blockbuster.xml is one comment, no PIs, 756 text nodes, 382 element nodes, 57 attributes, and 382 namespace nodes. We don't specifically mention namespace nodes, but they're all getting the default namespace associated with them. But again, more on that in the future. Um, here's the contents of the files, but with the type of node prefixing the value of each node. So all of these nodes have names or values, or all of these nodes have names. So what I'm doing is, is upon encountering database, I'm saying, you know what, database is an element. Now we'll ignore namespace. So oh, actor is an element. Oh, ID is an attribute. So this is just sort of a type checker, right? A utility program that just helps us see the world like the processor is. Well, how does this work? That's perhaps the more interesting question for us. Well, scrolling down now, we have this call to type checker. Who are we checking the type of? Well, we're passing in a parameter called nodes, and we're selecting all of the child nodes, unioned with all of the attribute nodes, unioned with all the namespace nodes. Now realize, I need to explicitly say this, because actually, per your comment earlier, why are attributes not getting handled? Well, we were never selecting them before. So if you want to select attributes, you need to specify that axis because they're not children of anything. So all that line here means is that call type checker passing in all the nodes in the tree. And here too, we could do this differently. We could recurse and do it that way, but we just did it a different way here. So what does type checker do? It iterates over all the nodes it's given in dollar sign nodes. For each such node, we have this big branch construct. If the node, and this is where your XPath is going to push their, your mental limits, at least on first glance, I think, if test equals this, well, what the heck does this mean? It is non-trivial to test whether a node is an attribute node. Um, because unfortunately, there is no attribute parenthesis, close parenthesis instruction So in XSLT1. So if we specify to figure out if a node is an attribute so that we can say attribute colon, we're doing this test. Brownie for whoever can explain this test. If you award the count of the current node with the count of the parent's attributes, and then it's the same as the count of the parent's attributes, then you must be in an attribute. Okay, good. So if you or the current node with all of the attributes of the parent node, and you get back the same thing, logically you must be an attribute because when you union two sets together, duplicates go away. So if you're unioning yourself with all of the attributes, but you're not augmenting the size of the set, that is, they're the same, well, you yourself must be in that set of attributes. So sort of a hack, but sort of neat, though, how it works and how it ultimately goes to the definition of parents and children and attributes and so forth. So again, to be clear, this answer is yes or no, am I an attribute? I am dot because that's the current node that I'm iterating over. So if I take myself, unioned with all of the attributes of my parent, and remember, attributes have parents. It's just those parents don't have attributes as children. If the number of nodes, with including myself and all my parents' attributes, equals the number of my parents' attributes, well, then I must be one of those attributes. Ergo, I am an attribute. And so we print as much. If instead, I'm a comment, now it gets easy. If I'm a comment, I'm a comment. If I'm a uh, PI, I'm a PI. If I'm a text node, I'm a text node. This one's a little interesting. Namespace node, same issue. So we use the same solution. And scrolling down, pretty much brings us to the end of the document, except for this guy. Otherwise, I just left the you know, juiciest case for last, element. I'm just going to print out my name. And so in this way, can you test the types of nodes? Um, perhaps useful not so much in practice, since you probably don't need to test the type of node, because you can just be more intelligent initially on what types of nodes you're selecting. Right? Recall, we started this whole mess because I selected all of the nodes without regard for what they were. Because at the top of the document, I did know what they were. I just lost track of that information effectively in the uh, call to this uh, uh, template. But it, again, just sort of ties together a lot of the little details we've been looking at today that out of context are perhaps completely 
unintuitive or just inapplicable to real problems. Yeah. So is there no test self colon colon element? Self colon colon element. I do not believe so, which is why we leave it as the otherwise here. It, it does. I'll have to look at the XPath 1 and 2 specs again myself to see which of these no tests exist. Um, but yes, that's absolutely a concern. Though, checking the type of a node in this way is fortunately not something you typically would have to rely on because you can get that information first. Yeah? This one being like, relevant for this, but are, are the when um, elements, are those um, like the equivalent of ifs or if else? They are if else, okay. so they will not re um, redundantly get applied. So it's not like saying if, 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 it's if, else, if, else, if, else, if, even though it's not as clear, frankly, as the syntax might be. So where are we going next week? Finally, I can stop waving my hands at namespaces. They're not all that interesting, but they will help us to keep clear a lot of the languages we're going to be looking at as we start to integrate not just XSLT, but also SVG into our input, and we start playing with JSPs eventually, and a number of other syntactical things that might otherwise get distracting. SVG is scalable vector graphics. Again, you can do things like plot out your wireless signals and just generally generate um, graphics on the fly, similar in spirit to things like Flash, Flash, Macromedia Flash, Adobe Flash are s similarly vector-based graphics. So these are similar in spirit, but interesting because you output them as you glanced at uh, in XML format using various XML elements. And we'll also glance at what's called XSLFO. It turns out that XSL in its original vision was actually twice the size of what it is now. So essentially early on in the process of XSL's development in the 90s, uh, XSLT and XSLFO broke apart such that they were originally together, but it was realized these are really very different languages. They are both uh, transformative, la they're both style sheet languages, but functionally very different. So they became separate languages, which is why we have XSLT and XSL. XSL, though, is more generally called XSLFO for formatting objects. And long story short, what we'll see in XSLFO is perhaps the most complicated syntax that you will see in this course, such that we will intentionally only scratch the surface, focus really just on some of the basics, and give ourselves enough savvy so that with projects three and four and perhaps the final project, you can at least use XSLFO to generate things like PDF-based purchase orders for one of those projects and PDFs in general. Um, it's a nice way of taking XML and XSLT and actually generating something that sort of can be physically interesting, like PDFs, but it's really like learning a language like PostScript or PDF itself. And if you've ever you know, right-clicked on a PostScript file and opened it in a text editor, consider learning that in a night. It is not something we will try to do, but we'll give you enough to actually do things that are useful with it. So with that said, let's officially adjourn, and I'll stick around for some section-based Q&A.